In the present economic climate, many companies are finding difficulty hitting their financial targets, and if they do, it's often at the expense of environmental and social aims. And yet, the consumer goods giant Unilever is setting itself some very ambitious targets. It's aiming to double its sales, whilst at the same time reducing its environmental impact by 50%. Well, I'm joined now by the CEO of Unilever, Paul Pullman. Welcome to INSEAD Knowledge. Very ambitious targets. How are you going to achieve that? Yeah, well, one of the things that we're working on, obviously, is a business model that is a longer-term business model. Uh, right now, I can share with you that just the, the three years of the journey, we're doing reasonably well with our turnover having gone from the about $38 billion to last year $46.5 billion and our profits have responded positively. So we believe that a, an equitable and sustainable growth model does not have to come at the expense of uh, either top or bottom line growth. In fact, if that is your strategy, I would submit it actually accelerates your top and bottom line growth, and that is what we're trying to show. And so far, uh, also with our shareholders, which is one of our stakeholder groups, uh, we've translated that into a reasonable return. Uh, I personally believe that more so in this world than in any other world that we, uh, that we live in, uh, companies that are in tune with society, are closer to the needs of the population at large, after all we're a consumer goods company, are better placed to be successful and that is the essence of this model. It's a gross model. Mm. But you, you're still not setting definite time targets by saying within a decade by 2020 we're going to actually achieve those. Why not? Uh, the reason we don't set targets is because uh, we've made a commitment uh, from the day one when I became a CEO uh, to go out of the guidance uh, with the market. The uh, issues that we faced in 2007, the financial crisis and beyond, was basically, a, I, I always called it a crisis of ethics, but short-termism. Uh, management of targets to the market versus managing your business. And we firmly believe mm -hmm. uh, we need to manage our business. That's why we look at it for the long term. Uh, we've abolished guidance, we've abolished quarterly reporting for those reasons. And uh, this target of the ambition of doubling our business and totally decoupling it from growth uh, is a target that is a, a vision that obviously doesn't have a fixed time but could be achieved in a 10-year horizon. Mm. Uh, and we're well on our way to do that. But it does seem like, in a sense, a radical new model for business, the idea of decoupling growth from environmental impact. It's a very risky strategy. Well, I don't know if it is a radical new business model. I think it's a realistic business model, uh, but it's a difficult business model. But in a world where increasingly uh, uh, the population at large feels that the system is unfair for them or excluded, where there is an enormous resource stress, uh, companies that don't more actively become part of the solution, I think will be obsoleted. We've seen increasingly with the digital age, uh, the power of the consumer coming up, and uh, I always tell our people here, if they can bring down a regime in Egypt in about 17 days, they can bring a, an irresponsible company down in nanoseconds. So to take a business model uh, with the premise not on how you can take from society and the environment, but how you actually can give to society and the environment, in other words, in other words how to make this world a better world, I don't think it's that radical. The challenge is to do it. It's not easy because it requires a different way of operating, uh, more transparency, partnerships, all the things we can talk about. So that's where the challenge is. But the essence of what we do, I think, is the origin of capitalism in the first place, but we just forgot about it. In a sense, you're possibly doing this at the most difficult time. The economy's in a mess. Many companies, perhaps less brave, will be tempted to take the easy route. Let's just get our financials sorted out, and then we can take care of the, the other stuff later. Well, we don't live in an either-or world. I think if you make this part of your overall strategy, you can live in the end world. And there is no reason that green growth is bad for your profitability. In a world where a billion people still go to bed hungry, where we get increasing shocks of climate change, just last year alone, you go from the floodings in Thailand to the droughts in China or in Australia to the hurricanes on, in, uh, in the U.S., um, it, it is costing business a lot of money already. So we're living in a world that is already stressed. Occupy Wall Street movements don't happen by coincidence. So businesses that, tr that make a business model uh, that responds to the needs of society are going to be successful. And if you make that business part of your business model, if you make that your strategy, you plan for it. The origin of this company and many others for that matter is actually to improve society. 
So the basis, and then we, inf we were part originators of the Sustainable Agricultural Initiative, mm -hmm. the Marine Stewardship for Sustainable Fishery, the Roundtable of Sustainable Palm Oil. What we've simply done is built on this heritage of this company, its strong values, looking at the long term, wanting its communities in which it, with, uh, in which it operates to do better, take all these strong values and make it part of an integrated business model. Now, it's a lot of hard work. We've looked at all of our products and did an impact assessment across the total value chain, from sustainable sourcing to our own factories and offices to the consumer, what we call sustainable living. Uh, we've made it the offered strategy, reach one billion people to improve their nutrition and well-being, decouple growth from environmental impact, source all your agriculturally based materials sustainably. These are clear goals and there are 50 hard measures under that. We've built it into our R&D programs, into our brand programs. And if you make this part of your overall strategy, you actually can move quite significantly. For that to work, you've got to have people obviously aiming for those big targets, but they've got to have a kind of granularity in their individual targets so they know what they're doing. How do you do that? Well, that some of these targets obviously are easier for us to achieve short term. Uh, how to get sustainable tomatoes if it is one ingredient, but to do 100% sustainability is not that easy. Uh, some of it requires uh, us to make decisions, buy green energy for your factories, um, operate your factories under zero waste. Some of them require coalitions of companies. We've created a round table of sustainable palm oil. Uh, the Global Consumer Goods Forum, making a commitment to not buy from illegal deforestation by 2020. And some of them require policy frameworks where we work with governments or NGOs to, to put the frameworks in place. Um, by setting such audacious targets, it certainly makes us feel uncomfortable. It requires us to work differently. But we see that the mind expands and that uh, solutions are being found at, uh, at, a, at a faster level than it otherwise would. We probably we're leaders in the field on sustainable sourcing for agriculture, but after 130 years in business, we only had about 10% 10, 10 of our materials sustainably sourced. Because we've set the objective of having all of our materials sustainably sourced in this period of about 10 years, just in year one, we're about to issue our first year report, we're already at 24%. Because we're making these commitments, we're converting all of our ice cream cabinets, for example, to natural refrigerants. So, we're creating critical mass behind that with companies like Coca-Cola or Pepsi or others who want to join us, different coalitions again. But by setting these objectives, not different than when Kennedy said, put a man on the moon, uh, you stretch the mind and, uh, and you achieve things that probably with our normal baseline thinking or incrementalism would not have been possible. And that is uh, tremendously energizing for an organization like this. This idea of value you're talking about now, it seems it's much more all-encompassing and as well as getting your marketing right, you're also getting consumers to play a big part in this as well. How do you control consumers? Correct. Well, we don't want to um, interpret that as getting consumers to do what we want to do. We think that it is a unique opportunity in today's world with the digitization happening. Consumers are getting connected over two and a half billion devices already. Uh, connected in a place like India, you'll have more mobile phones than toilets actually. Uh, the speed of uh, the social networks expansion. So we, we are very fortunate that we have about 2 billion consumers using us every day and these consumers are increasingly connected. And as we see with the Arab Spring or the movements that uh, we've seen like uh, Earth Day or rebellions when Netflix or Bank of America tries to put up its fees, consumers are increasingly discovering their connectivity and their powers. And we're simply saying we as a company are open for you to help with our small actions to make big differences. You individually might not think that drinking a cup of sustainable Lipton tea is going to make the difference, but you're two billion of you, and those two billion are connected. Become part of the movement, and increasingly we see that consumers are willing to exercise those powers. Exercise those powers in a positive way for companies that are able to deliver at a time that governments and institutions are becoming more inward focused unfortunately and likewise willing to punish companies that they think are believing irresponsibly and there frankly is no bigger power than the power of the wallet at the end of the day for business and that's the, the consumer 
in this case is really the boss and that's what we're doing. So we're opening up our company to the consumer more than anything else. It does seem that your focus is very much on these, these emerging markets now rather than your, your comfort zone of your traditional Western markets. Well, it's the reality of the numbers. Uh, we have 80% of our growth coming from the emerging markets, 55% of our business is there. Uh, if we like it or not, in 30 years' time, eight, over 80% of the population will live outside of Europe and North America. So, and that is actually the 60% uh, of that population will live in mega cities, all in coastal areas. They will be the most stressed areas. It's already happening now. You see uh, India wanting to pass a tax on sustainability. You see the five-year plan of China having this as a big uh, one of the three legs in there, uh, people are getting uh, increased awareness that uh, that stress of population growth and resource scarcity is not going to be sustainable. And you don't want less social cohesion. It would really be a, a tragedy for this world. So finding solutions of green responsible growth, that those are companies that, that will have an abundancy mentality and that will succeed in the future. Give me some examples. You take it from the sustainable sourcing, for example, which is very important. Uh, what we've done is for each of our products in the total supply chain, we've done an impact assessment. Where is the biggest use of water, packaging, waste, CO2? And you take, for example, agriculture. That's where 70% of the global water use goes. So if we want our sourcing of agriculture, uh, we focus on in, uh, drip feed irrigation versus, for example, flood irrigation. We focus on different techniques of soil management. So that's the sustainable sourcing of tea. Uh, there is a limited space of agricultural land, and yet in the coming 30 years, we need to produce as much, as much food as the previous 30,000 years. People don't realize that. The food supply has to go up by 70%. So sustainable sourcing is very important for us and for the future of this world. Then you look at our own shop, which is the easiest part, but actually very small in the total value chain which is to run all of our factories with zero waste to significantly re reduce our own carbon emission or water. And we do that over the last five to 10 years, 60, 70% reduction, but relatively small impact. And then we go to the consumer, and this is where the bigger challenge is. How do you mainstream sustainability? We obviously built it into our R&D pro program. One of the examples would be comfort or fabric softener. Instead of uh, three wrenches, and uh, using 30, 40 liters of water, we've developed a product that only needs one wrench. Very meaningful for many parts of the world where water is scarce. Our detergents that give you better performance at lower temperatures with less water use would be another example of that. So for each of our uh, waterless shampoos uh, would be another one. So for each of our products, we try to adapt to the stress situation where the biggest impact is. So these are all the elements that we're now able to get involved in with partnerships around the value chain to get to these very challenging goals. You don't set these goals, I don't think you'll move the needle that fast. So you have very much a, a long-term view with this plan. Uh, the problem, I suppose, is how do you get your investors on side? Because traditionally, investors have a very short-term view. No, absolutely, and that is, a, that is a challenge still even today, although there is some improvement. We have uh, responsible investment guidelines coming out from the UN now. We see the sustainable banking initiative that is actually initiated here in the UK. Uh, we see differences now in compensation or incentive systems. Uh, interestingly, more and more of the discussions are uh, not only the top and bottom line financial measures, uh, but they're starting to look at some of the other things. Uh, so the, the trend is positive, but in my opinion, not fast enough. Uh, first of all, we need to start by ourselves. A lot of education a lot of education to the investment community about our strategy. The second thing we have to do is to be sure that we uh, work on stimulus for longer term behavior, uh, uh, rewarding patient capital, having perhaps different share structures or dividend structures. And Europe is looking at that now, uh, this, discouraging, if you want to, the quarterly reporting. So we have to change behavior. Education, change behavior. And then at the end of the day, obviously uh, providing the transparency and the framework also from our financial community so that people like us, most of the funds are basically pension funds actually that invest in the financial markets, that we as consumers get more involved how our pensions are invested, which ironically actually are, are supposed to take care of our long-term needs and not our, not our short term. So you're now actually saying to some investors, if you're just going to be short term, we don't want you, go away. We, we actually are, we actually are. We simply say because the wealth is big enough 
and um, you cannot cater to all your shareholder needs. The, the, the needs of your shareholder base are simply too broad and diverse. And I think management and companies should take a stronger stand to make clear about what their strategies, what their strategies are and actually disinvite some shareholders. And we would do that, and we've actually done that. We make that very clear. We also make it very clear that the purpose of our company is actually not, is not just satisfying shareholders. Uh, we are here really as a company to satisfy consumers and do that well and do that well over the long term. And by doing that, we will reward shareholders. And we don't think that's a compromise. Uh, it is increasingly proven that companies that are monoptically focused on creating wealth for their shareholders tend to be very short term with a very short life or actually sub-optimize that wealth. Uh, but it requires a lot of discussion, a lot of transparency and communication and some changes in the frameworks in which we operate to get to these objectives. So it's a journey, but I'm very happy actually to see how, that, uh, how we are progressing in this area. The amount of money that is coming into socially responsible investment funds is uh, increasing drastically actually. But what do you say to an investor who says to you, I don't really care about the long term, I'm only concerned with the short term and the bottom line. What do you say to someone like that? There will be those investors, but um, I will not be able as a CEO uh, to satisfy all investors. No, absolutely not. Uh, life is about choices, and we've made a choice to attract investors that have a long-term perspective. So I certainly have satisfied myself that I cannot satisfy everybody. If I would, the company would not be successful. Because we have a clear strategy that we communicate, we attract the right shareholder base, and so far that has translated itself in the last three years, which are not very easy years, in an over 60% return. So nobody is complaining there. But yeah, there are shareholders that uh, don't like what we do, but the world is big enough for them to put their money elsewhere. You're the only CEO of Unilever who hasn't come up through the ranks. In fact, you spent most of your career with one of your biggest competitors, Procter & Gamble. So in that sense, it makes you an outsider. Uh, is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Obviously, when I came here, I spent an enormous amount of time understanding the history of this company and its values because we will ne really not change that. And because of that understanding, We've been able to launch the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, I believe, and also uh, embed what made this company great. But at the same time, we realized very well, also in this company, that we needed to progress to the needs of today's environment, and that required some drastic changes in the company. And by having had some experience on the outside, I probably was better able to bring in a perspective of what was needed to, to get again on a winning path. So you take that combination and your total life experience, and, and hopefully that is working out. The future will only tell. I think you should only judge the CEO not by the results they're getting when they're there, but really what happens with the company after they leave, and that's obviously my main concern. How can I put the culture of this company, the structure, the people, into a continuous uh, uh, outperformance of the industry? That's really uh, the type of organization we want to be in a business model that is very uh, aspirational, not only for our people, but also for the world at large. And that's what we're working on, and that's obviously a very exciting journey for all of us. All right. Paul Pullman, CEO of Unilever, thank you very much for Thanks joining us at INSEAD Knowledge. Thanks for your time.